Hi, Larry Benko back again, and this is part two of Matching Fundamentals. Since I did part one a couple weeks ago, I received an email from a guy who asked me a very simple question. And the question was, if I've got a circuit which has, say, like a capacitor in series with it here, and I measure an impedance here, and, want, and I want to back calculate on what the impedance really is at the load, why can't I use an inductor to, to balance out the capacitor or to compensate the capacitor's effects? And there's four reasons that that doesn't work. Um, well, it's three, real, three good reasons, and the fourth one is kind of a result of the first three. But let's go through them very quickly. This capacitor has reactance of minus J50, and it has a little bit of resistance, but it's very negligible. And if we put an inductor in here, which has a reactance of plus J50, we get a result when we're done of basically 50.28 plus J0, which is pretty close to 50. Not exactly, but it's pretty close. And you might say, well, that does a good job. The inductor balanced out the capacitor. I read the impedance here. It's basically what the impedance is back there. And the answer to that is true. However, if we look at that over a frequency range of 6 to 8 megahertz, it's only true at one point. So we really truly have not canceled out the effects of the capacitor with the, um, with the inductor. We've canceled them out at one frequency only. Secondly, in this case, while the reactance, while the resistance didn't matter much, there is a difference here. Here's our original source at 50 plus J0. Here's our other one. I uh, don't know if I can get quite there. Six. To, let's make a number, large number of points here, see if I can get closer to, closer to right there. That's pretty close. This, this is basically 50.3, so there's three-tenths of an ohm in error. And that is due to the loss in this component and the loss in this component. In this case, since this Q is 10 times this Q, it's the loss primarily in the inductor. And you could see that if you wanted to make the inductor have a Q of 2,000, we'd see that curve get a lot closer. But nevertheless, whether it gets closer, it doesn't get close. There's loss in this component, and there's loss in this component, and two losses do not cancel each other out. So that's the second reason. So we have the first reason, which is it's not, um, uh, it doesn't work over a frequency range. It only works at one frequency. And secondly, the loss doesn't get canceled out. The third reason is kind of anecdotal, and that is not all components have a, um, a complementary component. There is no, um, no component that's complementary to a resistor. Um, here's a case where we have 50 ohms here. A 50 ohm resistor, we want to we measure 100 ohms here. We want to know what the value is here. We need to undo the, the 50 ohm resistor. And the way we undo that is with a minus 50 ohm resistor. Well, a minus 50 ohm resistor is the way you really do it. There is no comp, uh, complementary component that undoes that. Same thing is true of transmission lines. So there's, re, there's lots of reasons why we shouldn't do this uh, with an inductor. The fourth and final one is just a matter of simplicity. It's no more it's no easier to put a capacitor in here of the proper value with, it, with, with the same value with a negative sign in front of it than it is to put an inductor in here. They're both equally easy to do. And if it's not easier to do, uh, if the inductor isn't easier to do, there's no reason to do it. This gives you a perfect match. We look at it, zoom in. It's, very per it's perfect. We sweep it. We are sweeping it right now. It's perfect again. Um, you know, this is basically the way it really, the way it really should be done. So let's um, look at that just a little bit, a little bit further. Not only is it important to use the component that undoes the previous component. Let's let's define how SimSmith's kind of working here. SimSmith starts with an impedance here at the load. It adds the effect. When I say add, I shouldn't say add. Um, it includes the effect of this component on that impedance. That's the new impedance. Then it includes the effect of this component on the resulting impedance here, and it keeps working its way back. Eventually, when you get to the end, you've got the final, the final impedance. And that's a function of frequency. I mean, it, do, it, it does the math for, in general. So if we have two components here, let's get rid of the second component for a minute. Let's say we had two components in our, in our match. It doesn't matter what the values are. There's two. We know we have to undo the effect of this one. We have to undo the effect of this one. So 
To undo the effect of this one, we I'm going to copy it, Control C, Control V, put it here. If I undo the effect of this one, and I take this one, Control C and Control V again, copy it here, and undo the effect of it, I find out I don't get the right answer. And it is important that the order of the effect is, is, that is applied is applied exactly opposite of how it how it was applied to begin with. So if we apply, apply the effect of C1 first, then apply the effect of L1, we need to undo the effect of, L, of L1 here, then this one undo, undoes the effect of C1, and we get back to the right answer. So it's important that the circuit runs exactly backwards to compensate itself out. And this should be um, pretty easy. You can play with this very, you can play the play with this to your heart's content. I mean, so that's the beauty of SimSmith. Um, that um, it's, to me it's obvious, and I think it should be to everyone else eventually, that in some, in some parts of a circuit, higher impedance parts of a circuit, a component will have more effect than it would have, than that same component would have had in a lower impedance part of the circuit. And that's why you basically have to apply these steps exactly in the, rever in the reverse order of how they were initially applied. So let's go back here for a minute and think about what kind of, I'm going to delete all the components again for, for a moment. What kind of problems do we want to solve when we solve matching, uh, matching type problems? The most likely problem we'd want to solve, in, in my opinion, is we know the antenna impedance out here or the load impedance. It could be a component, doesn't have to be an antenna, but we know that and we know it over frequency if we were going to, if we we're going to worry about over, worry about it over frequency, but we know it at the one frequency that we're going to use it if we, if we're only going to look at it at one frequency. Now, that's the classic Smith chart pro problem. The most, the simplest Smith chart programs that I've ever seen would at least at one frequency allow you to put components between the load and the generator to get a match. And in some very simple programs, the capacitors are ideal, the inductors are ideal, the transmission line's ideal. Then as we move up a step in, in complexity, um, the capacitors and inductors can have Q, the transmission line has loss, et cetera, et cetera. SimSmith has just taken that to um, a much higher level by allowing lots of components, including automatically calculating components like the L network here, uh, isolation blocks, which allow you to repeat, the to repeat a different part of a circuit, but you, know, you can have more than one circuit in, a, in an individual uh, SimSmith window, et cetera, et cetera. But they're all doing the same thing. They start at the left, they apply the effect of the first component, they apply the effect of the second component, they apply the effect of the third component, et cetera, et cetera, to get an answer. So that's the first and, and probably the simplest type of matching that you can do. The second one is kind of similar to this, but it's not quite the same. Let's, and, and, and before we go too far, on, too far along here, let's bring a file in, into here. The file um, is another way to put data into this load block. The load block uh, can have data applied as R and X here, or it can get, we can go get a file. Let's go get a file. And for this, for this file, um, I'm going to get a, a dipole here and just load it. And the dipole uh, has an impedance of, make it a little wider here. Okay, we're not going to be able to read this easily until we make it very wide. And that's why in SimSmith, I've, done, I've mentioned this before, hover over this. And this line right up, right below the top line here, where it says where it's, there's a thing that says view here, it will tell you exactly the path we took, and you can see the name of the di of the uh, the file that I loaded and and the location also. Um, basically, uh, if we take take this file that we have here, and we want to just use it as is. We're doing the, the first example problem I mentioned in terms of we know the impedance here and we want to match it. But let's suppose that this represents an antenna that you put up in the backyard and you've got a chunk of transmission line at attached to it. This, um, this transmission line does not need to be this generic one. Um, Dan McGuire, AC6LA, has provided a huge data um, huge table of data for lots of different transmission lines. I'm going to put Belden 80, excuse me, RG213 in here. 
And I'm going to assume that this is um, 30 feet. I put the dipole up in the air 30 feet. This is a 30 foot piece. I happen to have a 30 foot piece of, of, of transmission line floating around. I connected it to the end and this is the point I'm going to make my measurement. If I make my measurement here and I do not wish to go back this direction to calculate anything, this is still the basic matching problem. I'm just starting with this impedance rather than this impedance. So if I'm starting right here with this impedance, I can uh, do a match. We can do a match like this. Get that a little closer here. It's awful close. Okay, we can do a match. These, this was the only thing we were doing in in Sim Smith in terms of a match. This, we could pretend that this doesn't exist, and we had had a load with this with this impedance on the output of it. So Sim Smith just acted. To apply the effect of this component and this component in terms of getting a match. That's still the same problem we did before. Now, let's assume for a moment that you didn't have a 30-foot piece of coax floating in your bra in your basement. You went to the store and you bought a 50-foot piece. Came, came, comes as 50 feet. Let's get rid of these two components again now. And this is the impedance I measure. I've got the, the transmission line comes down to the ground or whatever. It's, it's down there, and it's got, you've got extra. This extra that you've got may or may not be 50 feet. It, you go buy a piece at the store, you expect it to be at least 50 feet. It could have been 50, 51 foot. So it's hard for you to go backwards all the way to get the load impedance. However, if you know the coax type and you want to go back some number of feet, that's perfectly reasonable. So we take exactly this piece of transmission line again, copy it, Put it here and make, I'm just going to set these to be one foot steps just for demonstration purposes. Set this to be zero right now. We're back to where we were before. This has no effect. If I want to take a foot off of this line, I just subtract a foot and I can see my path working its way back. I don't need to know the actual length of this, of this line here to be able to take a foot off of it. All I needed to know was the final impedance I had that I measured and then how much I'm going to take away. So it's not important uh, in this case. However, if I wanted to know the actual impedance of the, of the antenna itself, I would need to have known the actual length of this piece of transmission line. So let's proceed on st the, nevertheless the, with, this, with this example. So I will shorten this transmission line some amount. I know I need at least 30 feet, so let me start shortening it. Well, there's, there's, 17, there's 18 feet I've shortened it, which gets me 32 feet. That's kind of a nice point. We talked about this last time, that this point would allow me to match this with nothing more than a shunt capacitor. And there's my match. Now, these two are effectively 32 feet. If this one had been 55 feet, this would have, and this 18 had been, it would have been a larger number. It wouldn't have mattered what it was. Um, so we didn't need to know exactly this number uh, to go forward. We need to know this number to go backwards accurately, though. So in this case, this is 32 feet. So let's just see if that's really indeed 32 feet. If I, if this is equivalent to 32 feet. I take that out, and I see the same answer. If I have a 100, 100 watt transmitter here, then Basically, I get 95.66 watts to the load, or to the, to the generator. Excuse me. The generator generates 100 watts. I get 95.66 90, watts to the load. So this is a fairly simple um, you know, matching case, but, but it demonstrates the fact that we wanted to go backwards here. So there's plenty of times when you want to go backwards a little bit. Uh, you may want to go back and choose not to later on, but at least you have the ability in SimSmith to go back and, f back and forth from a measurement point that exists between the load and the generator. Now, there's an additional problem. And the additional problem that you might want to solve is what range of impedances can a circuit match? So let's get rid of 
this and this. And let's set the sweep rate to be say like seven to 7.3 megahertz. We will we'll still use the same file here. And this is an impedance right here that we have at, at, the, one, at the one frequency, 7.14 megahertz. If we want to see the impedance over the 40 meter band, there it is. This dipole happens to have an impedance in the 87 ohm range, which is indicative of something that's about 0 0.35, 0 0.4 wavelengths above ground, which I think was a 50 foot above ground uh, dipole, which is about, that's about correct on 40 meters. These, these numbers came from easy neck. So I want to take this, this, this range of impedances and I want to match it. And I'm going to match it without any transmission line right now, just, just for purposes of doing a calculation here on a, on a, on a circuit. I will build a circuit that can match. Well, before I before I do that, let's go back to the non-sweep mode. I want to build a circuit that can match this point here back to here nicely, and I'll do that by basically putting, let's say, put a shunt um, inductor in there to start with, and we can put a series capacitor in here. We match it. That will match this. That, that will match this circuit. Likewise, we could have matched, and that's 2.2 2 .2 microhenries and 509 picofarads. We can also match this by, uh, we can match it with that circuit. And both of those are perfectly valid things to, valid circuits to match. So, if we have this circuit that we want to match, but we're going to make it with components and we are not sure of this impedance exactly, let's pretend we got this impedance just from Easy Neck, which in this case I did. That doesn't represent what I actually built. Or let's pretend that uh, this came from some other measurement that I didn't trust completely. Maybe it, come from, it came from a, um, a table in the, in, in an antenna book. Uh, I really want my range of impedances over here to be somewhat larger than, than that single point and I want to be able to still match all of those points. If I build this circuit now with components that are variable, let's do that. So I'm going to come over here and click on name. I'm going to vary C1.F which is the capacitance and I'm going to vary L1.H which is the inductance. I'm not going to vary the frequency anymore. I'm going to do this at one frequency. I'm going to vary both of those. I'm going to vary the capacitor, let's just say, from about, um, I'm sorry, the capacitor from about uh, 40 picofarads to, let's say, um, let's say out of 500 picofarad capacitor. And I'm going to vary the inductor, which is now a little less than a microhenry. Say I, say I had a 2 microhenry inductor. Uh, variable inductor, a small, a little small one. And it could go maybe to say 150 nanohenries. I'm going to sweep both of those, and I'm going to look at the sweep. So, what does this sweep actually tell me? This sweep is not the range of impedances that this circuit can match. This sweep indicates the range of impedances presented to the transmitter for this one load impedance. So let me say that again because that's, that's an incredibly important distinction. As opposed to having this be a variable, adjust the circuit to give me always 50 ohms, we had this be fixed, we adjusted the circuit and saw what we got. So this is not the problem you really want to do. This problem represents something that's, I don't know, it's, let me, let me be, just be frank. It's kind of a worthless calculation. If we know we're going to want to match to 50, this doesn't tell us what range of impedances over here would give us 50. This just tells us with that exact impedance, this is the impedance we could present to the generator. So now let's go look at this a slightly different way. Um, we want to look at it by going backwards through this circuit. So to go backwards through this circuit, we can do this a couple of different ways. But I guess for, um, for right now, um, let's, let me just start with a, new, with a new version of SimSmith on top of this one. Um, this one we're going to go backwards. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this circuit over here 
we're going to not use it any longer. We're going to start with 50. We're going to reverse the order of our components. They're going to become negative values. This doesn't really matter because we're going to sweep it. And this would be the circuit. But down here below, we need to actually have these be negative values. Now, this is the range of impedances. This, okay, first of all, we look at the two graphs. They have some similarities attached to them, um, but they're not that similar. Um, this second one is the, so given, so we're running this circuit backwards. What this is producing is for a starting, for, excuse me, for a starting point anywhere within this area, I can get a match to 50 ohms. So the match is on this side now. There's 50 ohms. And the reason this doesn't include that area is because these components cannot be reduced to a value that, in, that allows 50. I cannot match 50 plus J0 to 50 plus J0 in any L network unless I allow components to go to zero or infinity. So, but that's not important. Here is this little circle down here. If you look at this little circle, this little circle represents the impedance we had before and it's the impedance that, that you get with these component values. These component values were the component values I used before to get my match to 50. I'm going to look at the, these component values. I'm going to click right here. Then I'm going to zoom out just so I can read this again. And I see that the capacitor I needed to do that was 972, excuse me, 221 picofarads of capacitance and 972 nanohenries of inductance. It does not match those in exactly because the center of this circle is not on one of those grid lines. These grid lines, the intersection of these grid lines represent all the individual points that, that were scanned to give me this graph. If I had picked more points, I could have gotten something closer. But what you can see is very obviously um, that these are extremely close to those values. This is the calculation you want to know that you have. Now, the question you ask yourself is, how accurately did I know this point originally here? If I knew it within a confidence area of here, say about this area, I can say with 100% certainty that this network will match. Is that, it's actually this network because we're going, we're going out, we're going this direction. But so all the impedance impedances in a certain area here will give us a match to 50 ohms. And this graph right here really doesn't mean anything at all. So I hope that's clear, and I hope un people understand the the significance of that, because the significance is, is pretty great. There's times when you want to do the calculation in one direction, there's times you want to do it the other direction. So what fundamentally we're doing here, and maybe I should just reiterate this one more time, is if I start here, okay, let me see if I, it's easy, probably easier to start with the, no, it's, let's start with this one. Um, I'm going to start with um, this 87 number, I'm going to match this to 50, and then I'm going to, what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to undo it, undo the match with negative negative component values. I don't need to sweep anything. Oh, I'm not sweeping. Okay. So where where am I at here? When I get to the very end here again, I'm at this point down here, which is oh, that's why it's wrong. Okay, I'm back to where I started which was 87.6 minus J.342. All I did in one case was I, so if this circuit is running this direction for all the time. I do this, include the effect of this, I include the effect of this, I include the effect of this, which undoes that, I include the effect of this, which undoes that, and I'm back to where I started from. And I hope this makes it uh, a little bit clearer. It's kind of a difficult concept and I get a lot of questions from people that, that don't quite understand the, the, how to do this. So hopefully this has helped somewhat. One more thing to consider when we do matching. I didn't mention this before um, well enough, but uh, transmission line components are easily usable as L's and C's if you wish in a circuit. However, they're not always the most efficient way to do things. In this case right now, Real quickly, let me do a, a very simple example. 500 ohm load, which is a 10 to 1 SWR, 
we're on 20 meters. I'm going to include a piece of transmission line, and I'm going to include a let's just let's make this transmission line reasonably good transmission line. Let's say it's um, I don't know LMR 400 is not not you know it's it's nice transmission line. It's not bad or anything. And let's take this circuit here and go to this point right here. From here we need we're capacitive on this side. We need a series inductor here to match. And let's put a series inductor here of value necessary to match this, whatever that turns out to be. And adjust the length of our transmission line just a little bit to get this match to be a little bit closer. And get the match good. Okay, now, in this case, let's run, let's run the legal limit in power, 1500 watts. This inductor, if it's Q of 200, will consume 21 watts. 21 watts is, let's see, how, how big is the inductance? 1.6 microhenries. We can probably beat that pretty easy. We probably get a 300Q easy just by winding it with maybe 12 gauge wire. And uh, let's, say it's, let's say it's Q of about 300. That's not that unreasonable. Uh, now let's take this circuit here and let's replicate the circuit. And this is one of the beauties, again, of SimSmith, is I don't have to change this component out or anything else. I can just replicate the circuit. This circuit here, we're going to clone the generator, and we're also going to take the impedance back here and use it right here. So you see the same impedance in both places. Let's take the same piece of transmission line here, put it there. And now, in place of this, let's take the same piece of transmission line we have here and put it here. And now we need it to be a series inductor. A series inductor oh, there we go now let's make let's look at this one this this trace I'll get back to explain that in a second here and we need a length it's kind of longer than we than we had before we're gonna need a longer piece of transmission line here oops here, shorten this a little bit. There we go. So, I have two two circuits here. We have a, a generator and a load, another generator and another load. So the path here gives us two choices: the path of, of impedance from the, this generator to that point right there, and the path from this generator, oh, excuse me, from this load right here to this generator. So if we, and, and the line through it means we don't, don't have anything. So if we put a line through both of them, nothing to plot. If we plot the first one, we see what we had here was a match with the transmission line being 17.83 feet, excuse me, 2.943 feet long and a 1.6 microhenry inductor. Here we needed a little bit longer piece of transmission line and we needed a fairly long piece of um, this stub here to, be, to give us the inductance. In the first case, we saw 1,484 watts come through to the load. Here we only see 1,398. This inductor is not very efficient, to say the least. Its Q is, well, it's got 100 watts in it versus 14 watts. So let's, let's take this um, out of the circuit here for a minute. Let's just, we can just build yet another circuit. Let's build another circuit here. Same piece of transmission line. Now let's put a new inductor in here and let's see what Q we have to. What Q do we have to have? We gotta get the inductance the right value approximately. And what Q of inductance do we need to be equivalent to our transmission line? Okay, in this case, to get we didn't get quite there exactly there, but if Q was 40 for that inductor, we would have 101 watts lost here, 100 watts lost in a piece of transmission line, and only 14 when we made when we made the inductor efficient, um, efficiently high Q that is. So here's a case where this series stub was not probably very wise to use in the circuit. Uh, had a lot of loss, and that's with decent size collects. Let's do the example again, but this time let's go to a different place on the circuit. So we'll take our original uh, transmission line here, 
and we'll make it longer. Let's make it, make it long enough that we get to the point over here where we can match with a shunt inductor. We'll match it with a shunt inductor here. And we'll see that we have 13 watts lost there. And we have um, 1,416 watts delivered to the load with 70 watts lost in the, in the overall piece of coax. Take the, let me delete that one, delete that one, delete that, delete that. Take this piece of transmission line, copy it over to here, copy it again to there. We're going to work on the middle section now. In the middle section, we need a, a stub which gives us the look of a shunt inductor. There it is. Now we'll look at the middle circuit. And we will increase the length, I'm sorry, decrease the length of the inductor. Okay, it's a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, shorter length there. And a little bit shorter length here. Pretty close. And then we'll look at the last one here where we use an actual shunt inductor. Okay, so the first case, we have a good match, 1416 watts delivered to the load. The second case, we have a good match, and we have 1388 watts delivered to the load with the stub having 43 watts in it. The stub has three times as much power in it now as the original inductor did, but it's not that bad. Um, the inductor actually, in this case, looks to be like it's a like it's a two like it's a Q of two hundred. So the length of the transmission line has a big effect on how efficient it is. It's pretty easy to 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 look at a piece of transmission line and say to yourself, "Well, it's a bunch of little series L's and little shunts and shunt C's." If I want this to be a capacitor, the first little shunt C acts like a capacitor, and after that, my second shunt, uh, shunt C is separated by a little inductor. So the curve you get when you do a transmission line uh, is a little different than what you get when it's, a, when it's a straight inductor or capacitor. And since you need to add length to it, there's loss in length. And when the stub length becomes large, you either need incredibly low loss transmission line or you need uh, to realize that the loss is going to go up. But there are plenty of cases where using transmission line stubs to match is very, very valuable. In the second case, the additional loss um, in the first case, we had 100 watts lost in the stub. Here we have 43 lost in the stub. And this is with a 10 to 1 SWR. If the SWR had been lower, we would have had less, less in both cases lost in the stub. But nevertheless, this is, a, this is an example of using uh, stubs to uh, rep replicate um, the capacitance or inductance that you need at that point in the circuit. And stubs are used strictly for the simple reason that they're convenient in some cases on a circuit board, they're extremely convenient because they can be built into etch, but in the real world, um, they're used because it's convenient to do them. Maybe there's not a component that you can put in, the pl in place of them that's the right value. Um, maybe they're cheaper than the, than the component. You know, there's lots of reasons. Nevertheless, you, uh, they, they have the same we uh, weatherproofing uh, requirements that the regular piece of transmission line had, so you don't have any extra weatherproofing to do where if you put a variable capacitor there, you'd have a lot of extra weatherproofing. But, um, you know, it's, 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 another, it's another tool in the bag of matching that sh you should be aware of. And this is probably getting, this video is probably getting to be too long right now. So 
I'll probably do a, do a matching three at some point in time. But uh, for right now, I'm going to move on with some other topics uh, real quickly that are pr probably more basic topics that are uh, of more value than, than matching. But matching is really an interesting thing in SimSmith. You can play with it to your heart's content. And SimSmith does a really nice job of telling you what you did well and what you didn't do so well. Uh, losses are a real good ind indication that you didn't do things well or you did. And um, component sensitivity is another thing. Uh, component sensitivity, if I have my mouse set up to change the length of my component, say like 1%, um, this is a 1% change in one direction, 1% change in the other direction. Uh, I'm looking at the right, holy, no, I wasn't looking at the right place. Let's do here. 1% change in, that's the effect of my final match with 1% change in my series transmission line length. If I want to go back to the other one here and I want to look at the effect of the shunt, a 1% change in the shunt, it didn't have too much of, a, too much of an effect. The 1% change here had a bigger effect. So you can see that the sensitivity to the line length at where you place the stub is fairly important, but the actual length of the stub itself isn't as important for you um, cutting it. Of course, this was length in percent. Length in percent isn't length in inches. You make mistakes in inches. So, you know, in reality, maybe I should have gone over here and I should have set this to be a, um, a one inch segment. And I should have set this to be a one inch segment. And then I should have gone, well, if I can get this one within an inch, hope that was a that was a foot. Darn. Um, here, let me do this. We'll do a tenth of a foot instead. Here's a tenth of a foot increase and decrease right here. And here's a tenth of a foot increase or decrease here. So both of those had, had about the same SWR effects. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, SimSmith does help you in that regard. If you build a filter, you build some part of a circuit which, if the capacitance or inductance varies by 1%, the match goes from one one to one to two to one. You probably don't want to build that circuit unless you're really capable of keeping that component from changing much. So it's those kinds of things that Sim Smith does a really really nice job with. Anyways, thank you very much for your time again. I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully this video has been been interesting.